Well, as I was working on this series on the Enlightenment thinkers, the bell rang. So I want to thank Southside Christian, but I'm going to have to finish this lecture from my basement. And it's as good a time as any to shout out to Supreet and all of the other great people at Seven Lakes High School in Katy, Texas, AP Euro. So let's go ahead now and look at the Enlightenment outside of France. And I want to focus on two philosophes in particular. I want to focus on Immanuel Kant and Adam Smith to wrap this up. Uh, and then we will look at the American Enlightenment at another time. So Immanuel Kant was a Prussian philosopher who is famous for writing several things. Now, first of all, he wrote, What is Enlightenment? Now, What is Enlightenment was a, an essay that he wrote just to basically explain explain what enlightenment is. And in another video, I've already given that a very thorough treatment. To put, but to put it briefly, he said that enlightenment is the escape from self-imposed knowledge. That enlightenment is about thinking for yourself. Enlightenment is about not being an intellectual child, so to speak. And so in matters of religion, in matters of politics and philosophy, thinking for yourself and not letting institutions do your thinking for you, which is pretty much at the root of the enlightenment. The Critique of Pure Reason. Now, this was Immanuel Kant's most famous book. Uh, of course, he wrote a lot of books, but The Critique of Pure Reason is the most famous. And if you really want to get deep into the critique of pure reason and Kant and all of that stuff, I would recommend Dr. Sadler's channel because he does some awesome stuff. I think I'm going to do a podcast with him at some point about Immanuel Kant in particular. But the critique of pure reason addresses the relationship between reason and experience. And remember, as far as the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution, you have this, uh, this tension between the empiricists, the people who believe that decision making should be based exclusively upon experience, and then the rationalists, uh, the ones who believe that decision-making should be primarily based on reason. And so when you look at somebody like Francis Bacon or David Hume, very, very empirical. Whereas Descartes, uh, you know, when he believed in dualism, you know, he, he believed that sometimes our senses can play tricks on us. So while, you know, empiricism may have its place, uh, he believed that rationalism was superior. So I'm not going to pretend to know everything about Kant and his philosophy, but that Kant was exploring this relationship between reason and experience, between rationalism and empiricism. And Kant is also known for his ethical system. Now, of course, uh, you know, when you let other people do your thinking for you, uh, then you just absorb whatever morality comes comes to you from the church or from society. These actions are right. These actions are wrong. And you never really look at these things critically. Well, what Kant comes up with, okay, if we're really going to figure out what constitutes a right action or a wrong action, what he put forward was the categorical imperative. If it could become universal law, then would it be beneficial or not beneficial? So imagine that everyone was going to behave the way you're behaving in this situation. Uh, there is a great uh, episode of How I Met Your Mother where Barney Stinson is telling Ted that, okay, it's not a good idea to try to date your doctor. And Ted says, well, this situation's different. And Barney says, no, this is the platinum rule, so to speak. And really what Barney Stinson is saying is like, look, there aren't exceptions. That this particular category of action, the categorical imperative, so in this category of action, there is something that is always going to be right and always going to be wrong. That something is not in the same sort of situation a good idea sometimes and a bad idea others. So Barney Stinson, very much a follower of Immanuel Kant, whether he knows it or not. So going on to Adam Smith. Now, Adam Smith is the father of modern economics, and he's most famous for writing an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, otherwise just known as wealth of nations. And so what he's doing here is he is questioning conventional wisdom. So if you think about Kant saying, you know, think for yourself, superiore, dare to know, uh, Adam Smith was questioning the conventional wisdom of mercantilism because the predominant economic system at the time said that you need to 
limit imports. You need to maximize exports. You need to try to protect your bullion, your gold, and your silver. And so you need to regulate trade. The government needs to be kind of the coach of the team. Economics is like a rivalry. And Adam Smith is thinking, you know, not so much. He's exploring some things. And, and really, he's using the Enlightenment. Again, when we watch Sesame Street and stuff like that, selfishness is bad, right? But from the Enlightenment perspective, selfishness is neither good nor bad. Selfishness just is. Selfishness is natural. And as Voltaire said, Self-love is the instrument of our preservation. It is necessary. It is dear to us. It gives us pleasure. And we must conceal it. We can't let anybody know we're full of ourselves, but at the end of the day, we are full of ourselves. I mean, look at just about anyone's social media profile or anything like that. Human beings are self-interested. Now, here's the thing that, you know, some people would say, well, maybe we need to try to retrain human beings. Maybe we need to put them in front of Sesame Street or something like that. The Enlightenment's really about, look, just accept that this is and turn it into something rational. So when you look into this, uh, you know, Adam Smith, he puts forward this idea of rational self-interest. And, you know, really what goes into this is, all right, so why do I teach? Okay, well, I make money teaching, right? I make money when I teach, tutor, sell apps, uh, you know, anything that I do. But at the same time, I'm not going to make money if I don't provide a good service, if people aren't getting what they need. If you're watching this video, you're thinking, okay, I'm still watching because he's explaining something to me and he's giving me something of value. And so if I give you something of value, then you will watch my channel. Maybe occasionally you'll watch the ads. So I can make a penny or two or something like that. But when it comes down to it, I as a teacher, although I teach out of self-interested motives, I have the incentive to give people something of value. And if I'm not doing that, they're, they're not going to watch my channel. They're not going to sign up for tutoring or anything like that. They're not going to buy apps. And so... I prosper when I do things that are good for other people. So this idea of enlightened selfishness, of rational self-interest, this is what goes into... Whoa! What happened to my hand? Oh my goodness. It's invisible! Whoa, look at that. I'm waving at you with an invisible hand, right? All right. Hey there, Seven Lakes and all of you people and uh, Lisa and all of those folks. So hey there. See? My hand? invisible. This one's not. This one's visible. Invisible. Now watch this. Now they're both invisible. But anyway, the invisible hand of self-interest, that we don't need a visible hand that is regulating the economy, all right? We need uh, really, like, People don't have to be told what's good for them. If I go to the butcher, for example, and I'm going to look at the meat that's available there. Now, you don't have to tell me to buy this red steak versus this green steak with flies going all over it, right? Uh, you don't have to tell the butcher, like, hey, you know, if something's about to expire, mark it down. You know, it's like people would rather buy the fresher stuff, but then they have the incentive to buy something that's expiring. All of that kind of stuff. When it comes down to it, the butcher is a businessman or a businesswoman. Of course, uh, anybody can be a butcher, right? It's the 21st century. And so the butcher needs to provide a good service if he wants to stay open. Because if I go to the butcher and I get sick, then I'm not going to go back to that butcher. And so Adam Smith wrote, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. And so here's the thing that like, okay, people are selfish. Well, once again, it's kind of like when Montesquieu said legislative, executive, judicial, separation of powers, checks and balances. We're taking advantage of human selfishness, which is neither right nor wrong. It just is. And we're putting it to use for a higher purpose. And we create a mutually beneficial exchange. And once again, we have here empiricism, all right, that Adam Smith is looking at, uh, you know, human history and seeing that, yeah, I mean, people act selfishly. The trick is to show them that they're best off acting selfishly when other people also benefit.
And so therefore, everybody's happy because when it comes down to it, self-love, as Voltaire said, it's special to us. And if we can all do what we want and what makes us happy and what we're good at and we can all prosper, then it's not a zero-sum game anymore that the economy can grow and we don't even have to not be selfish in order to do it. Wow. Enlightenment. And again, we look at the sufficiency of natural law, that we don't need a government to tell people what to do, that, you know, if people have all of the information and they're not willfully cheating, then nature is all that we need. And that goes along with this whole enlightenment idea of natural law. And thank you very much for watching this lecture on the Enlightenment. Hopefully, you'll subscribe. If you haven't already, visit my website, social media, and all of that, that good stuff. And at another time, I will go into the American Enlightenment. So watch for that video later where I'll, I'll talk about Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Paine. It's always a pleasure.